God, we come to you today, and we are thankful uh, to be in the presence of your throne room. Uh, give us the humility and um, a spirit of emptiness so we can be filled by your spirit, to be filled by you. God, uh, some of us come in your presence with heavy hearts and struggles and pains, and so we, uh, we come with sorrow and anxiety. So God, we ask that you continue to be the great provider, the great peacemaker for us. For those of us who come with open hearts and joy and thanksgiving and blessing, uh, we pray that we continue to see that all things that we receive comes from your glory, and uh, we give you um, all blessings. God, we are so thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, and uh, the good news that Jesus has shared to uh, be the one to come to this world to create a message of newness and resurrection so that we can be raised up uh, to give glory to you. And God, I pray that we continue to be witnesses to that. Again, uh, we are mindful and thankful for all of us, and uh, we are particularly thinking about those who in our church um, lift up Teresa and others who are fighting for cancer and other um, ailments and illnesses, and thankful for new life and continue life, so thankful for birthdays like Lori's this week. Uh, God, continue to bless us this time together. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We're going to be in Acts chapter 20 mostly this week, so or this, this morning, so if you want to Go ahead and turn your Bibles there. Uh, we'll be there momentarily. Uh, if you are uh, with us for the first time, a couple weeks ago we started a new series on looking at leadership throughout the New Testament. Part of the reason why we're doing this and we're trying to create a combined adult class setting is because our church in the fall uh, will begin a elder selection process. And so that will be something that will begin um, early fall. And so because of that, we want to kind of reflect and pray and discern about the exciting possibilities of affirming current leaders, but also recognizing new leaders who are coming up to, to guide us and lead us in the future. And uh, with that, because with leadership comes change, there often is some anxiety and, and wondering, you know, what's, what's going on? What's the next horizon for us as a church, and I think all of us know this, but it's always good to be reminded that probably the, the most special, unique thing about processes like elder selection processes, or in my case, in your case, a year and a half ago, preacher selection process, is there's an opportunity, right, to gain confidence um, that there's only so much we can really do. It's kind of a humble thing about humans, right? Is um, there's only so much we can control. There's only so much we can do. And in recognizing um, some of our own selfishness, in recognizing that there's only so much we can do, uh, that's when God really shows up. And we can have confidence that the Spirit of God is moving, and we get to witness how God uh, interacts and shows up in our church, and also how God shows and interacts in the world. And so I think, again, like any seasons of transition for churches, this is a really, really good opportunity for us as a church. Last week, we talked a little bit about, uh, so we're going through some Old New Testament books. Uh, first, time, first week, we talked about Jesus and why I think Jesus is really the model of leadership uh, for us as God's people, and, and that's obviously layered in so many different ways. And now we're starting to introduce uh, some, some books in the Bible that kind of talk about leadership. And as you'll see, as we talked about last week, if we just looked at leadership chronologically, so if we just took some of the newer writings in the New Testament and just trying to figure out what they had to say, we see that, that in many ways leadership is, is growing. There's however way you want to call it, maybe a progression of some sorts. And early on in the churches, it seems to be that function, function of leadership, um, Proceeded or was higher than title of leadership. Does that make sense? And so, uh, for example, you'll see the early churches, if they were calling leaders, they were calling them for specific tasks. So that would be one example. So, hey, we got something out here that we need to get done. We got a group of people. Uh, and within the group of people, there's probably some, maybe some experts that know about this. Maybe there's some people who got some time on their hands. Maybe some people that got some money. I mean, all these things matter, resources and different. So let's Let's get these people, whoever they are, 
and specifically task them to help us succeed in this particular endeavor or area. And so, in many ways, function um, became more, I don't know, more important, but definitely was higher in terms of what we're looking for in a leader than title. That changed it a little bit uh, because, like I said, in 1 Thessalonians, you could already see that there was some model of leadership in Scripture. The reason why we brought up 1 Thessalonians last week and some other passages is because 1 Thessalonians arguably is probably the earliest writing of Paul's. And in that passage we talked about last week, there is some hint that there are maybe some people that are having at least some level of power or authority and that we should kind of honor and respect and submit to that. Their primary function, though, remember, function precedes title, was that their primary move for the Thessalonica church was they were really good about reaching out to people who have lost their way in Christ. And so uh, let's, let's submit to those types of people who are really good about going out and trying to help tend to those folks who are, have maybe have lost their way, Okay. And in Philippians, this is kind of where we ended last week, and I'm only going to spend a little bit of time on this. Paul writes to the saints in Christ Jesus with the bishops and deacons. And so now we're starting to get, okay, who are these bishops? And then who are these deacons? We talked a little bit about deacon, diaconia, in the first week with Jesus. This kind of this idea of servanthood and, and uh, submitting. So maybe a good metaphor for a deacon or diaconia is a server at a restaurant, right? They're just kind of at the whim of the customer. And so, um, so that's why you should always tip them really good, even if they're not very good at serving. Um, so that's just my plug for servers. But anyways, um, yeah, so they just kind of let themselves go. They're, they're empty themselves for the sake of others. And so the next question is, okay, well, if we have a kind of a good grasp on what a diaconia is, what's an elder? And so that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today is we're going to start beginning the idea of processing what these different titles mean. And titles that we are familiar with and know that exist in the New Testament, right? Of course, the main one that we understand is elder. Uh, Maybe another one would be um, shepherd, which will be the one we'll talk about today. Bishop will be one. And so these different functions and titles start having a place in the early church. All right. With that said, I feel like there needs to be one point that we missed or uh, did not complete last week because of time. And let me just talk about that as we transition over. Because function precedes office, or at least that's what it suggests early on in the movement, um, one might ask, what are the implications of that for the whole church if function becomes really important? Um, and that could include bishops and deacons as well, okay? And I think what that means is because function is so important, that's why it's so valuable and significant that we emphasize in a system of church that focuses on mutuality, meaning we're all working together. Does that make sense? I really think the one anotherness that we highlighted last week is so important that that becomes maybe a primary trait. That, yes, there's followers and yes, there's leaders, but there's something significant throughout the New Testament about this level of coming together and working together of shared giftedness, of shared submission of shared mutuality, it's life together. And so, and, and that just doesn't mean, you know, the whole thing about, hey, you know, can't we all work? It's not just working. It's not everybody has to do something. It's not everything, everybody has to be in a small group or everybody has to serve in a ministry and everybody has to, that's not exactly all of it, though that is part of it. But the question is, right, I mean, what is each of our investment in the local community of faith? And what are we doing to help share and offer good news to one another, but also to the world around us? So one thing that I think we fail to see as an opportunity, but is a really good opportunity in elder selection processes, right, is 
how can the entire church get more involved in the ministry and the life of the church, right? So we don't just say, okay, so how do, what, what couples or what, you know, what men and their wives am I looking for that I think are the most involved or uh, the best teachers or the best greeters? I think maybe a more appropriate question is, is uh, which um, couples or, or men with wives am I looking for that are really good about helping the church see the significance of of shared ministry, right? So they, they are good at empowering. They are good at inviting. Uh, they have a, a sense of hospitality, a, a sense of care for others. And there's somebody that um, inspires you to, to do good works. And I think that's important, I think, right? Uh, that we, we use... Seasons like this and other seasons. I'm sure you might even have heard a sermon during the preacher search process that said something to the effect of, look, we're not just looking for the preacher to change the church or help the church because we're all supposed to, right? I mean, so there's something like that maybe you heard one time. So I think that's my, that's my message or move right there too. It, hey, look, it's just not the elder's responsibility to lead the church. It's everybody's. We're a, we're a family, and in that family environment, there has to be a sense of shared responsibility, a sense of shared submission, a sense of shared work as we grow with one another and as we share uh, Jesus with the community. Good? All right. Now let's go. Let's transition. All right. We have noticed that leadership emerges uh, in the communities in which every member has a role, building up the body of Christ. We've already mentioned this. Uh, Paul did not envision positions that were superior to others. In fact, if there's anything he preaches against, it's those who think their position superior to others, right? Um, he thought tongue speaking was an amazing gift. In fact, he thought he was one of the best of it. But he wanted to ensure the church, the local church in Corinth, that just because you're really good at a particular gift does not give you the right to be more superior than other people's because of your gift. And so for Paul, his envision of position, of your place in church, was more about less, about being emptied. For Paul, his model oftentimes was the cross. If you, for example, just read the first two or three chapters of Corinth, or the First Corinthians letter, excuse me, you will see this language of emptying oneself, being people of the cross, Philippians, right? It's a church um, that has some issues. Uh, there are two women, in fact, probably women who are powerful leaders in the local church in some way or another, because it's a big enough deal where Paul needs to intervene, Iodia and Syntyche, right? And so, of course, before he even drops their name, he insinuates early on in Philippians that the life of the Christian is all about dying to oneself. Remember that passage? It's just die to yourself. Quit fighting. Quit, quit, um, quit creating conflict and divisiveness uh, because if you die to yourself, then you'll have an opportunity. If you empty yourself, if you see yourself as less than uh, diakonia, then you'll have an opportunity to understand truly what it means to be a leader in the kingdom. Well, that's what brings us to, to today's passage, I think, uh, because in Paul's speech to the elders in Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, we see significant aspects of elders and their terminology of leadership. They are elders, they are shepherds, and they are bishops. Bishops may mean reflecting more of kind of a supervisory wo uh, role. Elders, um, presbyters, or overseers. And then the one we're going to discuss today is shepherding. And so let's, let me read Acts 20 for you. Um, it's kind of a lengthy passage, but I think this will be helpful. And then we'll, we'll look at this and I'll have some questions for you. All right. Um, from, from Miletus, he sent a message to Ephesus asking the elders of the church to meet him. This is verse 17. When they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the entire time from the first day that I set foot in Asia. 
serving the Lord with all humility and with tears, enduring the trials that came to me through the plots of the Jews. I did not shrink from doing anything helpful, proclaiming the message to you and teaching you publicly from house to house as I testified to both Jews and Greeks about repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus. And now, as a captive to the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and persecutions are waiting for me. But I do not count my life of any value to myself. If only I may finish my course in the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the good news of God's grace. We'll keep reading. And now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will ever see my face again. Therefore, I declare to you this day that I am not responsible for the blood of any of you. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Keep watch over yourself and over all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherds the church of God that he obtained with the blood of his own. I know that after I have gone, savage wolves will come among you, not sparing the flock. Some even from your own group will come distorting the truth in order to entice the disciples to follow them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to warn anyone with tears. And now I condemn you to God and to the message of his grace, a message that is able to build you up, to give you the inheritance among all of you who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or clothing. You know for yourselves that I have worked with my own hands to support myself and my companions. In all this, I have given you an example that by such work we must support the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus, for he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. The word of the Lord. Okay, since Paul cannot be present in Ephesus on his um, final trip, he calls the elders to him at uh, Miletus, verse 17. The term elder or presbyterio simply means older person. That's all it means. Leadership by a group of old men so, sorry if I'm bending you if I'm using the word old man, but that's just what it is. Mature men. We could argue that one. <laughs> uh, leadership by a group of old men was a common feature in the ancient world, including Judaism. Okay? So, uh, imagine with me, it's the ancient world, and you're a small village, and there are still, for example, um, other nations, even underdeveloped nations, that kind of function with this type of model or system where the old guys of the community get together and discuss how to protect and care for and understand its local populace, right? So it's pretty common imagery there. And so, of course, this would be a common understanding throughout um, that culture and that message. And so you see, for example, throughout Scripture, there is this understanding of recognizing the authority of elders. Matthew 26, Acts 4, um, in the Old Testament even, and there's lots of passages there. So leadership by council of elders was common in the ancient world. And I think that's important because um, that that was, became a significant piece to how the church functioned in its, in its local context. And part of Paul's job was to come into these local contexts and find the older men in the community and help them establish their authority, help them establish um, um, who they were. And so uh, you would see that Paul ordains elders in, in um, every city, Acts 14, verses 23. And so that, that would be kind of Paul's, uh, maybe one of his mission points was to go in and help raise up and develop leadership. And of course, he's going to use a leadership style that people are familiar with, that they're used to, that makes sense to them. And so, of course, for them, it makes complete sense uh, to have elders, older men, uh, lead the church. 
All right. Leadership by old, so age, was uh, a self-evident fact in the ancient world. Um, age connects with what? Wisdom and experience, right? Well, in our post-industrialized age, our society does not necessarily think age and wisdom always go hand in hand. Whether we like that or not, that's just the way the world is now, especially in our society. In fact, um, we're one of the few countries where one of, right, one of some of our largest industries are homes that are trying to help older people, right? So, um, assisted living, medical homes, many, many of you have already have or have dealt with this in your own life with your own parents, right? But if you go into the ancient world, where do often the older people live? With their children, right? So, um, this is a, a conversation, right, that exists. So we understand this. So it's, whether we like it or not, it's a challenge that we must face. So what do we do with that? What do we do with a society that does not necessarily look at age first? Is that good? Is that bad? Or is that just the way it is? Why is it bad? Right, okay. Yeah, you make a good point. And I think um, it's interesting, right? There are two generations that probably feel the most unheard. That is our older generation and our younger generation. Does that make sense? So it's interesting how... If you, so you're right, I think there's this, I don't know, what, some bell curve or whatever, where, you know, I don't know what the, the prime age is to be heard. 50 maybe, I don't know. They say 50 is the new 40. Okay? So, um, so maybe you're up on top of the hill now, and you get to be heard. But beforehand, um, you still have some growing up to do. After, uh, you've grown up too much. Right? So I think there's some truth in that. Yeah, Joe. Good. What are some problems, like what are some examples of those problems? Give me some of those, Joe, because I think you're right. Yeah. Sure. So a spouse, being married five years is way different than being married 50 years. Good. So, um, if many of us would agree that uh, with wisdom there's got to be some level of experience, what's the cutoff age? So, how, how old do you really have to be to have experience? I mean, I don't know the answer, I'm just asking. Sure. Yeah. So Joe's also suggesting that is out there that um, there are those who are older who really don't have much wisdom. Good. Yeah. It's just a number, Dick.
Sure. Right. Good. Good. Can you can you take age too far? Um, what do you think I mean by that? How can you take age too far? Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Good. And just let me, let me be on the side of the young folks. I think there is a key important difference we have to understand, and this is why we have to process and talk about the, these things, is in the ancient world, things didn't just change fast, right? So um, let's say there was the invention of the wheel. I don't know when it was, 10,000 BC. I'm just throwing a date. They still just had the wheel without an engine even in the early centuries. Does that make sense what I'm saying? So cultural phenomenon, social things like that just didn't change fast. I mean, empires could last in hundreds of years. S today, right, things are changing so fast. And, and so one of the potential um, issues that we face in churches is sometimes older does not always understand the changes that have happened so rapidly, right? So there's wisdom. I think the reason why some older people are inviting back into organizations is because part of wisdom suggests they are, have understood and, and even maybe in some ways participated in some of the monumental and crazy changes that have happened. So I think there, there is that. So we, we are in a different society today, and I think we need to recognize that. Hold on. Yeah. Didi. I also think we've got to look at the balance of historical fact, fact. Yeah. Sure, so that's and another part of that, yeah. There are things that know the kids that would be different, but we have now, when we see people living up into their 80s and 90s, we feel very blessed that mama is, grandma is as many adults and kids we have here as she is. We can look around in our society, and we see people that are even 10, 20 years younger that time is caught up with them, and their mental maturity is not there now that may have been there 10 years before. So that's one of the things that we have to balance in with the wisdom. Yeah. Uh, she brings up a good point, and that is with our health system, people are living longer, and that's good and bad. Um, this was a blessing, and it was also a struggle. When the leadership I was in at a university church in Abilene, we had like 20-plus elders, and within those 20-plus elders, there was like four generations represented in that eldership, which is, diversity is great, but it's also created some some tension and some conflict, right? Because uh, sometimes that would come out in those meetings. So that's not a bad thing. Yeah. Good. 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 And I think the reason, so that's why elder, older generations, 
can become more wise because they've had more practice of failing and making unwise and then making wise, right? And so that's, I think, the significance of age sometimes is they have that opportunity to be able to just articulate what you said or live it out what you just said, which is wisdom comes through how you respond oftentimes to those things that, in, that you encounter in life. And people are going to fail. And so hopefully in, over time, you have a better grasp. Yeah, one more. Yes, absolutely. There's a lot of wisdom in that kind of I, the saying that says, the older I get, the less I know. I think the, the, whole, the whole point of that, right, is the more I rely upon God. And maybe there's the wisdom in that, right, is um, the, more, the, more, the older I get, the more I recognize I can't control things. I can't control death. Uh, I can't control disease. Uh, so you become, your reliance upon God becomes that much more. Joe, and then I think there's some more over here. Sure. You know, they got their uh, mind made up and, uh, and new things come along and not willing to uh, adapt to change or, or do it. And then they got to look at that too. When you put people in, are they willing to look at the situation and adapt it to the present situation now? Not what they thought it should be or what it should be, but what it, you know, it is now. Yeah, so um, Joe talked about, Joe talked about, um, and, and this is the tension is, he goes, sometimes, Older people have a more difficult time adapting, and the word change is used, so that's kind of, you know, that's a scary word. And I think that's true. I think, you know, once we get to an age, we kind of like the way things are. We want to kind of keep it that way, and there's no problem with that. Um, I think on the opposite side, I think sometimes younger people are over-idealistic. I'll just raise my own hand. And, and I just like sometimes just to change for change's sake because I'm tired that my room has been tan-colored, so let's paint it blue, right? Um, and then maybe a couple months later, I don't like that color, so I'll change a different color. Uh, so there is that as well. Eventually, you realize how boring painting is, so you just stop painting altogether, and you just stick with what you got. That's right. So it goes back to what you're saying. I think wisdom would suggest to both, and that's why I think older people have this advantage, wisdom would suggest, look, if you fully rely on God, things are going to change. Right? I mean, do we all, does that make sense? If, if you really think God's spirit is moving, things are going to change. The irony is, it's probably not going to change. It's probably not going to be the room color that I think it's going to be. And the room color may change, but it may not be necessarily the color that I think it's going to be. Yeah. Can we, yeah, Keith, go ahead. And then we're going to move on after this. We've we got to stop talking about older people. Yeah, let's switch to young. That's good. Okay. Sure. Good. Good. I think, and I think you're bringing up a good point, and maybe a point we should bring up now early on, and then we'll flush it out later on as the series goes on, is we're going to find that when we start creating, we start writing down a list of what we think qualifies a good elder, I think what the list does, it gives us a foundation to discern, prayerfully discern and acknowledge those who are rising up, right? And so if you put on the list, older age or more mature or wise, maybe those are all kind of clumped together, 
that doesn't necessarily mean they have to fit a particular age. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they've had to experience certain things, but in some way it does, right? It doesn't and it does. It's part of a way for the church to prayerfully acknowledge and discern the type of characteristics that we want to call upon for future leaders. And so I think that's right. I think that just becomes a piece to a more layered and complicated um, conversation. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah, and um, because of time, I'm gonna we'll we'll talk about the shepherd next week. But um, you know, the question has to come up: Then what is wisdom, right? Because especially in the age of information now, where I can whatever you say to me, maybe some of you already have done this. You can Google, so you could have Googled any time during this. Um, during this class, does elder really mean older man in the Bible, if you wanted to? And if it didn't, you could have said, and I had college students do this to me in class, actually, it's, that's not what it means, Mick. It actually means, and they would read Wikipedia, right? So you could do that if you wanted to. And I say that because we have to probably understand, articulate and define what wisdom is. And so I think... Um, when we, we'll wrap up this passage, um, yeah, one comment, and then we got to, sure. Sure, yeah, so that, so obviously Paul addresses that early on in Corinth, but go ahead, say something, Kevin, please. Good. 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 So let me, as 35 years old, impart some knowledge to you as we close. <laughs> Though this wisdom does not come from me. And we're going to talk about shepherds next week in the Apostle Paul, but uh, from verses 34 of 20, it says, You know for yourselves that I worked with my own hands to support myself and my, my companions. In all this, I have given you an example that by such work, here's your wisdom. Support the weak. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus. Especially this word. Remember this phrase. Remember this phrase. It is more blessed to give than to receive. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And the greatest example of giving, and this is what we'll talk about next week with shepherds, is that sense of emptying yourself. Look, shepherds have authority. Shepherding model isn't just submission and serving. Because someone's got to herd the domesticated animals, and somebody's got to feed the domesticated animals. But maybe most importantly, this passage reflects that, that it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Isn't that what we're looking for in leadership? Is that giving spirit? Who, is, who are those people who are those men in our lives that we see exemplify the giving spirit of God?